I want to talk with you today about, I think, a very important subject matter as it pertains to our faith, and that is believing God. You can't have a relationship with God if you don't believe in Him. And I'm not talking about how we, you know, might have some type of um, conclusion that we make about the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or something like that. Um, this is not folklore. This is not a fairy tale. The Bible doesn't start off, as I've said before, with once upon a time. Uh, the Bible is a historical document, a spiritually inspired, holy document where God reveals to you and I, people, normal people just like you and I, throughout the generations on how we might believe God. And that becomes a very important part of our faith because some of us today might be believing God for a breakthrough, for a miracle, for peace, for hope. We might be believing God for decision-making. We might be believing God just to get us through another day for safety, depending on what your job is. And on and on we go. And so a major part of our relationship with God has to do with believing God. In fact, the Bible says that it's impossible to please God without faith. And we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. And so belief, faith, trust, they all go together. And if you and I want to have a strong relationship with God, I'm not talking about religion, but a strong relationship with God, then we need to know, okay, what does the Bible say about believing God? Because we want to be able to believe God for it, whatever it is that we might have on our plate right now. And so there's a couple of verses from the scripture I want to share with you right from the start before we jump into our main text. And these are statements, verses, if you will, about believing in the Bible. I want to first start by saying you can't even have a relationship with God without having what we call saving belief. Now, what is saving belief? Well, Jesus said it to Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29. Why don't we say this verse together, okay? This is Jesus speaking together. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and I. When Jesus said this to Thomas, he said, Thomas, you believe because you see, because Jesus had his hands wide open. These are the wounds. These are the nails that paid for your salvation in full. But Jesus also said, blessed are those who believe who have not seen, who will never see like you and I. And so that's what we would call saving belief. We have a saving belief in Christ. But even after we come to faith in Christ, we need something called sustaining belief. Because every day of our life, there's a new challenge. Every turn of a season, might be a new difficulty or a new stress or a new storm. And just in general, even when life is going smooth, it's still somewhat difficult to operate. And so we need to have what we call sustaining belief. And the Bible's filled with examples of that. In fact, I would attribute our desire to grow spiritually, obviously is to grow closer to God, but also to develop a strong substantive belief in God. Now, again, not a fairy tale belief, not a religious belief, but a strong, dependable faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I want a strong, dependable faith. Who wants a strong, dependable faith? I never met anybody that said, nah, I, I don't need any help in life. I got it all figured out. Those are usually the people that fall flat on their face. And so this is what Romans 15, 13 says. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome, encouraging these people who were under incredible persecution, some of which were being fed the lions for their faith. This is what it says. In fact, why don't we say this verse together? Another verse to commit to memory. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And so there it is again, the centerpiece, in believing these things. What good is any of these verses, any Bible studies you do, any messages you hear, if we don't actually believe it? And so may the God of hope fill you so that you may have this believing faith, this sustaining belief. And then remember, going back to the Old Testament, remember God told Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as many, more than the stars of the sky. And Abraham believed him. Look what it says in Genesis. I'll read this one. It's in Genesis 15, 16. It says, and Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And so God accredits you and I, God blesses you and I as we put our faith and as we trust him, as we have belief in him. Now, what about when we're afraid? What about when we're going through difficulty? Well, look what it says in Psalm 56, three. By the way, this could be a, a prayer every day. Why don't we say this verse together right here? When I am afraid, I put my trust 
in you. See, fear is going to come upon us. Jesus acknowledged that. Remember in John chapter 14, the disciples, uh, they were, Jesus was preparing them for the cross. Even though he was going to the cross, he was preparing them for what they were going to go through after his death. And Jesus said what? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And so there's that component again of belief. Jesus was identifying that we're going to have fear, but don't stay stuck in that fear, belief. So then what's the goal of the message today? This is the goal, that we would live from a place of faith, not fear. And that goal is right there. Why don't we say that together? To live from a place of faith, not fear. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on. If you ever want to take a diet from fear, just do this with your TV. Not that there's knobs anymore, but you would just do that. You turn off or push a button. Or I guess you could even now, everything's automated. You could say, TV, turn off, okay? TV, turn off, okay? There's a lot of fear out there, a lot of fear mongering. Why? Because fear controls people. And the enemy, who is the maestro of control and fear, loves to combine the two. And so it then is imperative, no matter what generation you live in, no matter how old or young you are, no matter if it's the first time at church, you've been coming for all your life, it's important that you and I develop this understanding of God that we have a belief in him so that we are living from a place of faith, not fear. And there's a story in the Bible that illustrates that very clearly for you and I. And so I want to invite you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel that is found in the Old Testament. And as you find your place there, I'm going to give us the context because we're going to jump right into verse 11. The book of Daniel is written by its namesake, Daniel. He is a young Hebrew man along with his three friends and other young Jewish men who have been taken captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. See, in approximately 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, a person of history, you go study him, he ransacked Jerusalem and he took predominantly the young men captive so that they could work in his military and in his governmental work. And so the book of Daniel begins with that note as you start Daniel 1. And I would say the entire book chronicles uh, the life not only of Daniel, but what God is doing, and also speaks of the Babylonian empire who Nebuchadnezzar is the king of. And the Babylonian empire would be in power till approximately 539 BC until the Medo-Persians would come and ransack them. And so at this juncture in history, Babylon has no opponent that could step to the plate to overthrow them. King Nebuchadnezzar has no mortal equal. He rules the world and what he says goes. So when we come to chapter three, he comes up with this idea that I'm going to build this statue that's going to be 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, and when the song is played on the radio or on your iPhone or whatever they had then, okay, when you hear this song play, you are to bow down to this statue because you're worshiping my gods and me by doing so, and I'm king and you're going to do it. And if you don't do it, we have a parting prize for you. We're going to throw you in a fiery furnace that will lead ultimately to your death. Talk about oppression. Well, that's what's going on here. Now, at this juncture in the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they have already proven themselves to be good men, and the king recognizes that, and so he's promoted them. And when we come to Daniel chapter 3, Daniel's out on assignment, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we find out, have been elevated to basically governmental leaders over the providence of Babylon. So you would think that they're going to bend their knee and bow to this statue that's a false god. Well, let's see exactly what happens here. So as you look in your notes, we have listed for you starting at verse 11. But as we go back before that, we find out that some of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who didn't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because they're Hebrews who are now in governmental work for Babylon. So they didn't like them to begin with. You might have a few people like that at work, maybe a neighbor or two, maybe somebody in your family. 
where they don't like where you are in life. Maybe they're jealous or whatever reason it might be, and they're looking just to get at you. And that's what these Babylonians do. And so what they do is they come to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, those three Hebrews who you put in charge of the Babylonian providence, guess what? They're not bowing down to your statue. And you know what that means, King? You got to throw them in the fiery furnace. And so we'll pick it up here at verse 11. So whoever does not fall down and worship, that word's mentioned 11 times in this passage, will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Verse 12. Now notice this. There are some Jews who you have appointed to manage the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. And so here it is. The stage is set. They play the song, people are to bow down to worship this statue. Idolatry and false god worship was big in the Old Testament, we see. And so we see that these three Hebrew men, they will not do it. They're holding the line. They're standing strong. But it also says in verse 12 that there are some Jews. So in other words, if there are some Jews who haven't done it, there are some Jews who have sadly done it. There are some Jews who are so concerned for their lives that they're willing to worship this false god, but not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I believe a point about strong faith emerges that you and I are going to want to know about. And you might want to write this down in your outline today, okay? And it's this, refuse to have a fickle faith. Can you say that with me? Refuse to have a fickle faith. Now, what does a fickle faith mean? Well, that means someone who's inconsistent. You know anybody who's inconsistent? It's, it's very annoying. You know, you might know people like that. One minute they're for you, the next minute they're against you. Okay, God knows a lot about that because that's how, how we are sometimes. You know, we're, you know God, when, God's, when God's doing something that we think that we want, oh, we're all for God. But maybe when things don't go the way exactly we want, you know, we kind of step out on God. See, we're called to be followers, not fans of Christ. And that's something we need to remember. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not gonna worship this false statue. Why? Because they don't have a fickle faith. And you have to ask yourself right now, do I have a fickle faith? Am I consistent with God? Or am I just following God when it's good for me? See, there's different forms of theology out there. There's theology that teaches you and I that, you know what, go by your feelings. You do whatever feels right. The only problem with that is, is God didn't say that. And if you go by your feelings and I go by my feelings, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. It was the great theologian I told you about, Darth Vader. You ever hear of him? He said, your feelings betray you. He was on the money with that. Your feelings will betray you every time. I don't know about you, but my feelings always tell me what I want to hear, what I think I want to do. And oftentimes you'll see that your feelings and your faith will be in conflict with one another. Oh, but everybody's doing it. Oh, but I feel this way. Oh, but that's going to lead you to more regret and disappointment. You want to do it God's way. You want to live according to what God has to say. The other reason is, is that consistency will help you grow strong spiritually. It's been said this way, that motivation, that gets you moving. That gets you up. But consistency keeps you going and growing. If you want to be strong in any area of your life, you want to be a person who's consistent. And so I encourage you, be consistent in praying. Be consistent in reading the scriptures on your own. Be consistent with church. Over time, these things will yield a strong, believing faith. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's like going to the gym and you work out for an hour and then you go home and you look in the mirror and you're flexing, you're going, I don't see any change. I quit, I'm not going anymore. That would be ridiculous to do that. Spiritually, we do that too sometimes. We might read a verse sing a song, come to church, and we think everything's going to be different. We think, we're, no, it doesn't work that way. It happens over time. And I believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faithful to God over time. And I can't think of a better time than right now when you consider all that's going on, not only in the world, but in our own nation, in our own city, that we need to be reminded over and over again how important it is that we would have a strong faith, not a fickle faith 
but a strong faith that's not compromised. It's so important that we see it that way. Journalist and author Jim Tressel said it this way, the hallmark of excellence, the test of greatness is consistency. So we wanna be consistent with God. And as we are consistent with God, we will develop a strong belief in him. You know, listen, it's not take a pill and you're gonna become a strong believer. It's not, you know what, here's some holy water, just rub it on your forehead and you're gonna, you know, I know some people on TV tell you that. Be careful because I heard somebody got some of that water from one of these guys, on these clowns on TV and they rubbed it on their arm and their arm turned green, okay? So be careful with the, the fake stuff on TV, okay? Stick to the real stuff for scripture. And it's so very important that we don't see that there's, there's no such thing as a get-rich-quick spiritual scheme out there. It happens over time, like relationships you have in your life. It happens over time. And as you have consistency with God, you're going to experience blessing with him. So now, now the story is here. Nebuchadnezzar has said, if you don't bow down when you hear the song, you're going to be thrown into the furnace. Well, three of the men that are over the providence of Babylon, that are supposed to be his men, don't want to do it. And so how's that going to work out? Well, let's look at the next verse here in verse 13. It says, then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him. Now in Hebrew, what does a furious rage mean? It means he's angry, okay? Let me just save you the interpretation. He's very angry right now. And I think he's angry for several reasons. One of them is, is that he appointed them to be over Babylon's providence. So he probably feels a little bit embarrassed here that people that he set up and employed in this place don't want to worship how he's telling them to worship. But I also think he feels like he's being threatened here. But I think he likes them somewhat or he wouldn't give them this position. So he's going to give them one more opportunity. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 14, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? So he's asking them a question. Now, if you're ready, when you, I'm going to tell the band to play the song again, okay? So we get the band to play the song again. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zir, the lair, the harp, the drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. So he's giving them another chance. He goes, I'm getting the band conductor ready. When you hear the song, you go down and you worship it. This way I don't gotta, I don't gotta get my hands dirty throwing you into the furnace. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who could rescue you from my power? What a, what a question that was from Nebuchadnezzar. He's gonna later get embarrassed with that question. But notice it right here. You have one more shot. Deny your God and worship my God and your life will be spared. Well, what's their response? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. Verse 17, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. Now, so far, all of us would be like, yeah, I'm right with these guys. God could do it. Oh, God could, he could rescue me. I believe it a hundred percent. But look what the next verse says. And this is what I want you to really pay attention to. Could you say verse 18 with me? But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold, ugly, hideous statue you put up. We're not doing it. Even if we believe God could do it, we believe he could rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to your statue. And I think it's important that you and I see this. And I'll tell you why. I, I was just doing some research. The last time I spoke on Daniel 3 here at the church was 2009, okay? I was about 14 years old. No, I'm just kidding. I was a little bit older. Okay. Now, in, I listened to the message. I said, well, my voice has changed a little bit. I'm growing up, okay? Uh, but but I, I made this statement and I stand by it. This is a passage you and I should read regularly. And, and this is for this reason, this verse, because you have to understand something. We are growing up in a society today where people quote the Bible and teach the Bible, and, but they're, they're teaching us to focus on what could God do for you? 
And the problem is, is when it doesn't work out exactly the way we want it, we might think that God doesn't care. We look at other people's lives. How come this? I know plenty of people who prayed for their kids who were sick or some other reason, and their kids died. And they're still in church today. You know why? Because they have even if faith. I know people who they're praying for this one, praying for that, and it didn't work out the way they wanted it. But they still love God. Why? Because they have even if faith. And that's what you want to have, especially right now in what we're going through and possibly what's coming down the pike. You don't want to have a fickle faith. You don't want to have some fagazi religious belief. You want to have a faith that is built on the integrity of the scriptures, and you and I want to have an even if faith. Faith. So write this second principle down. Respond to hardships with even if faith. Can you say that with me? Respond to hardships with even if faith. You're going to have problems. What did James say, the half-brother of Jesus? Not if the trials come, when they come. So it's inevitable. There's going to be seasons of struggle. We all have a past. But I'm thankful in Christ, we have a future. I'm thankful that we have promises from God's word. I'm so thankful that, you know what? Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word, as we said last week, will stand forever. And we want to have this understanding here that we want to graduate from having a faith of God, as long as you do for me, I'll do for you. I want to graduate to a faith that says, Lord, even if I'm still committed. Even if it doesn't go the way that I want it to go, I'm committed. You know, I've heard the story of so many martyrs through the years. And the Fox Book of Martyrs is an interesting book to read. And I heard the story about James, who was the brother of John, uh, one of the apostles, obviously. And James was to be beheaded. He's, he was the second martyr after Stephen. And he was to be beheaded. And his accuser, who basically brought him in uh, before Rome and accused him, he was influential in him ultimately being put to death. But because of James's courage and his faith, his accuser became a believer in Christ. And he was thrown into prison, but he was so committed now to Christ that he said, I know I'm going to be executed, but I want to be executed now with James. Take my head when you take his head. That is an even if faith. And we want to have this understanding that God wants to move and bless in our lives. We have a lot of difficulties, we understand that. But we wanna have this even if faith that no matter what, no matter how hot the furnace gets in life, that we're gonna be committed to God. So now, as you look at this story right now, let's, let's just add it up here. Right now, you have King Nebuchadnezzar, who's an unhappy camper. He's saying that if you don't bow down and worship my statue, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to go on my phone on the furnace app and I'm going to put the furnace up seven notches, okay? I'm going to do it right now on my phone. I'm going to raise the notches up seven and the furnace is going to be lit that hot. If you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in. Well, guess what? They didn't do it and now he's going to throw them into the furnace. And he tells his men, he gets his strong men, he says, I want you to bound them up. And several times he says, they were bound up with ropes. Don't forget the ropes. They were thrown in with their clothes. And so now as we come to verse 24, we're jumping down. This is what happens. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, no appeal system here. They're thrown into the furnace. Archaeological discoveries show that the furnace, um, I don't know if they found the furnace, but furnaces like this in ancient Babylon over in Iraq and parts of that area, is that the furnace was set up high and you had to come up to a ramp to it and it had what we would call like kind of a glass door up top where you can look down in. And so this is the scene right now. They've been thrown down into the furnace, which means you can't get out, okay? You're gonna need help to get out. You've been thrown down. And when you get thrown into a fiery furnace, guess what? You don't come out alive. Keep that in mind. So here it comes. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped in alarm. He said to his advisors, as they were looking on their ring app to what was going on here, didn't we throw three men and bound them into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. Then he exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. 
This is pretty amazing. This is what we potentially might refer to as a pre-incarnate visit of Christ, the second person of the Trinity here in the Old Testament. They threw three in the furnace, but there's four. You do the math. God was protecting these men in the furnace. Not only did he protect them, he wanted them to be comfortable. Remember those bounds of ropes that were on them? He took that off. And they're in the fire, they're in harm. Nebuchadnezzar sees all of this, and it says this. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You servants of the Most High God, come out. His tune has changed a little bit. You might know some people like that. You know, they're real prideful, and then they get humbled. All of a sudden, their tune starts to change. That's what's happening here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Verse 27, when the satraps, the perfects, and the governors, these are all the different political leaders, all his henchmen, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on their bodies. This is pretty amazing, right? Not a hair on their heads, I like that part, was singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. They still smelled like whatever cologne they put on that morning. They didn't even have to take a shower when they came out of, I'm, I'm going to need a shower after just reading this for the second time. I still got another service after this, okay? This is amazing. They didn't even need to go to showers. God protected them so much that their clothes didn't burn up, their hair wasn't singed, and they didn't even smell like smoke. God was protecting them. And see, this is a miracle. Now, again, we don't always get the miracle we want, and they didn't specifically ask for God to protect them this way, but he did. He did indeed rescue them. And we need to have this understanding of God like they have had. Now, as it goes on to say, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, now this is verse 28, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He went, he sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own. What does this say about faith as we close? Well, you're going to want to write this last principle down. Refocus on God's faithfulness. Can you say that with me? Refocus on God's faithfulness. Do you know that God is faithful, the Bible says, even when we're not? God is faithful. So that's who he is. Now, for the last couple of weeks, what I've been telling you, don't focus on what God does all the time. And again, that's, that's sometimes what our faith, God could do this and he could do that. Don't get caught up in that. You know what you got to focus on? Who God is. And God is faithful. He's faithful to fulfill his promises. He's faithful to bring to completion the work he started in me and you. And I look at this here and I realize that's something we all need to remember about God's faithfulness, that God was faithful. He was faithful to protect his men. And even if the fires would have gotten them, there are other people in history that have died and they bravely faced the flames. They bravely faced the firing squad or the guillotine. Why? Because they knew that they had a hope beyond this world. See, we don't want to make quitting on God a habit. We don't want to be the type of person that's inconsistent with God that's not having an even if faith. We don't want to just say, you know what? I'm only going to trust God when it's good for me. We don't want to do that. That's going to become a bad habit. Legendary football coach Vince Lombardi once said, once you learn to quit, it becomes a habit. And so we don't want to have a quitter's mentality. We want to trust God right up until the end. And see, it was uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian who was in prison. And as he was getting led to be hung, he said to one of the other prisoners, he said, my life here has come to an end but the beginning is about to start. Why? Because for the believer, physical death is not the end. We have an eternal life to look forward to. And so sure, even, in a, even today, there's plenty of prayers here today that perhaps did not get answered the way we want to and somebody passed away tragically, or maybe we knew whatever it is, however it happened, that doesn't mean it's over because death is a new life. It's the doorway to new life for the believer in Jesus Christ. And see, Daniel's friends understood that. They understood that God is the giver of life. Even the great Job, who had incredible troubles in his life, he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And I pray that you know that today. See, it's not just about you and I going through life and everything is safe and nice and convenient. I heard the story 
about a soldier who was also a chaplain on the battlefield. And he was in en enemy territory and he was writing home to his family because his son, his young son wrote to him and said, Daddy, I'm praying for you to be safe so you could come home. And so he wrote, thank you so much, son, but more so than praying for my safety, pray for my bravery that I might do what God has called me to do and never renege or recant on my commitments. And in doing so, I'll be safer than I've ever been before. I submit that to you today. You stand on the promises of God. Don't get caught up in what everybody else is saying because the last time I checked in Proverbs 16, 1, God has the final say. And so let's trust in his faithfulness. Now, as we close, it's important for you to realize that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, some of you might be going, oh, Pastor Ray, you kind of got to believe in this story, right? Because you're kind of the guy that gives the message. So this really didn't happen, right? Well, that's, I, I, no, I do believe this happened. I wouldn't tell you this. I believe this happened 100%. In fact, you could go do your own study and don't even take the Bible with you. Go look up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There has been uh, archaeological discoveries that have been found over in the area of Iraq that have tablets and stones with their name on it. Why? Because they were promoted even higher after they withstood this episode in the fiery furnace. It's so important for us to realize that God leaves little clues for those who might have trouble believing sometimes. Not that you need those things, but it's to help people along. At the end of the day, we believe even though we have not seen. But nobody on the face of the earth could say, I can't believe. There's too much evidence in the Bible and even outside the Bible. Scientifically speaking, historically speaking, archeological discoveries, you just take a nose dive deep into the scriptures and then harmonize it with history and you will see that this indeed is God's word to you and to me. And it has been preserved all these years for you and I. And so I close with this thought. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if they could trust God and they're all the way in the Old Testament. You know, their, their lives are being lived some 500 to 600 years before the birth of Christ. How much more should you and I be committed to believing God that we're living in the light of the entire scripture and the fact that the cross is empty and there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem? How much more should we be believing God, even if, whatever our even if is, no matter what, because we're living in the light and in the power of the resurrection. You know, my prayer is, is that we will not settle for a weak, little religious faith. We'll have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ who died for my sins and your sins. And we'll have this even if faith. And we need that right now, don't we? Lots of craziness going on. I mean, even right now with the pandemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, it's important to realize we're firing medical workers and we're supposed to be in a pandemic, okay? You have to realize something. Politicians never let a crisis go to waste, okay? Hurricane, great, let's get something passed, okay? It's just how they think. So don't get caught up in political parties. Keep your faith in God Almighty. So important to do that. It's so important. And we have to realize the anguish that it has put on teachers, medical workers. I mean, last year, remember, we were throwing police under the bus. It's just our society is bent on division and confusion. Why? Who's the maestro of confusion? The devil. And he will use fear and division to control you and I, to keep us away from the things of God and the promises of God. But this much is true. Christ is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, and his power and supremacy will never be usurped, certainly not by any mortal being and certainly not by the devil. We know how the story ends. The devil is on borrowed time, if you will. We know without a shadow of a doubt that Christ not only came a first time, but he's coming again, the Bible proclaims. It's the hope of our faith. Christ crucified, risen, coming again. And so no matter what it is that you might be facing, you know, you might not have a situation, hopefully, like Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I believe everybody has a furnace they might be facing from one time or another. 
And you and I need to remember that no matter what, we can have an even if faith because we're not alone in the furnace. The Lord Jesus is with us. Trust in the Lord Jesus with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all of our ways, let us acknowledge him. And he will make our path straight, and apparently our clothes won't even smell like fire, okay? We know life is difficult and hard, but God is greater than all of those things. We want to be believing in God, trust in his promises. I know what this might say or that one might do, but don't look to the left or the right. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Well, every first Sunday of the month, we like to participate and have communion, and we're going to do so in just a moment. So I want to give you a few moments right now just between you and God to pray, and a communion, as you know, has no power to save us or anything like that, but it's a reminder of the one who has. And so just take a few moments between you and God. Maybe there's something you got to confess over to him. Um, maybe there's somebody uh, that you need to forgive or vice versa, whatever it might be. Just take a few moments in the quietness of your own heart to do that with God. And then we'll come back and um, we'll close the service by having communion together, okay? So take a few moments to pray just between you and God, and then uh, we'll come back and pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. We thank you for this reminder you have left us in the scriptures of communion, of that great sacrifice that was made on the cross and the hope of the resurrection. Thank you, O oh God, that you have forgiven us, O oh God. And so we want to use this time to refocus and renew our commitment upon you. We thank you once more for your love, for the, for the cross, and for the empty tomb. We commit these prayers now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.